associate with the countdown. Ten. On to your butt. Nine. Get to the chopper! Eight. Welcome to the party, pal! Seven. Bueller. Six. Where we're going, we don't need. Five. Four. That's a big toy. Three. Game over, man. Game over. Two. I am serious. And don't call me Shrub. Smile, you son of a bitch! It's showtime. Welcome everybody on Dead Jester Cinema to this kind of unorthodox review, movie review I should say, of Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. Normally it's just me, but I wanted to bring on my good friends from Ohio. Uh, Todd, you may remember from our Return of the Living Dead discussion, and down at the bottom, the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Vern Adams. Vern, say hello to the kind people who are not actually hello. with us right now. You wonderful movie people. <laughs> so we are actually recording this uh, two days after Frozen Empire has come out. And I went to go see it on Friday, I believe. Vern, you saw it Friday? I saw it. Actually, I saw it Thursday. Thursday oh, night. Okay, you saw it Thursday. Todd, you saw it yesterday. Yeah, so, I saw it yesterday. Saturday. So you are the freshest out of both of us yeah, are sure. us. <laughs> um, but yeah so like i said normally my movie reviews are just me but i wanted to do this i wanted to bring guys back that i had worked with before not only in doing reviews but doing other film stuff and maybe we turn this into like a monthly thing where we discuss a movie new or old and we'll just see how this goes we'll see how you all enjoy it out there so um so yeah, without further ado, let's just rip off the band-aid. Let's get right into Ghost up Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. Uh Vern, you are the newest one on this channel. Uh so I will start off with you. What did you think of Ghostbusters Frozen Empire? All right. Uh my overall opinion, I really liked it. Um it had some classic stuff, it had some new stuff. Uh it wasn't all about the kids. Uh, which I thought it was going to uh, be about. Um, a new villain that was refreshing. They actually did something that challenged themselves because of how society is now. It's just kind of like, well, why don't you do something new? And they did something new. So, and I believe, to me, I believe it worked. And there was a lot of, uh, uh, there was some nostalgia. And uh, I like, it just feels like they're trying to set up to, uh, to put more into the Ghostbuster franchise. Uh, yeah. All right, Todd. What did you think? <laughs> A resounding okay. <laughs> um, I, I, I didn't. I, I. It's a lot like the last one they did um, for me. I actually think I like this one a little bit better than the last one they did. Um. Uh, like Vern said, there was a lot of throwback stuff which i always can kind of do without um but like they did try some new things um uh but i yeah i, I think i i it's not anything i would really write home about but it was a good enough time for me all right all right so that just leaves me um i am very much in the same vein as todd <laughs> um I really wanted to love the movie. Um, when I got out of it, I thought it was okay. Like, I didn't dislike it. I didn't love it. Um, like like Vern said, I, what I liked is that they went somewhere new. It, it wasn't a rehash of Gozer. Um, and, oh, thank God. Even though I love Vigo, it wasn't... It, the early rumor was that they were going to bring Vigo back. And I'm like, no, please, for the love of God, no. Let's just leave that. Leave it alone. We don't need her Vigo coming back. But uh I, I like that it did something new. I like the expansion of the, the like the lore and the tech. Um I like them it's almost like a, a James Bond Q laboratory when they were showing the different sort of gadgets that they were making. 
Um, I, I liked all that stuff. I think what missed the mark for me was the where they tried to give this movie a heart. Um, like a, a lot of the melodrama, family stuff, the stuff that centered around Phoebe, it just didn't click with me. Unlike Afterlife, and this is where um, I'll be the reverse of Todd, I think I liked Afterlife a lot more than I liked this one. That, to me, had more of an emotional core to it. This one, it felt like they tried to do that, and it just it didn't hit, at least for me. Um, but uh, we will discuss that further. Um, the way I'm going to kind of tackle this review going through the movie is kind of more or less going step by not really step by step through the movie but hitting the major hitting the major moments and then we just discuss how we feel about those scenes um and and we'll probably hit a lot of what we like and dislike in those scenes um so we're gonna start off the movie opens up in 1904 i think it is and it shows the firemen responding to a call and you know everybody's frozen in the room and they discover that orb uh, that houses uh, Garaka. What did you guys think of the opening to this movie? It's 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 a little bit different. We haven't had a uh, like kind of like a flashback scene in a Ghostbusters movie like that before. Yeah, I guess we haven't really had a flashback. Um, I thought it was it was okay for a cold opening. It kind of like set stuff up. It it's a little bit like in the first one when they go to like the library. And it's kind of like, or not even they they go to the library, but you see the librarian. Yeah. In the in the beginning of the first one, and it's kind of like, it's setting up like that kind of creepy atmosphere. Um. So I think it's a little bit in that that kind of vibe that they're trying to to get something similar to that. Uh, and I think it was for what it was, it was okay. Yeah, I thought it was okay. Uh. Honestly, I mean, it was cool to see the firehouse, you know, and at that day and age. But to me, it really didn't do much to the story. You know, uh, you're just having the firefighters go to a response where, uh, oh, by the way, we, we are doing spoilers, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. By all means. Yeah. Spoilers for sure. Yeah. This is all my movie reviews are always spoiler. You can't talk about a movie without being spoilers. I'm sorry. You just can't. Right. Right. At right. least I can't. So, yeah. Spoilers, please. Yeah, so in the beginning, it it was it was an okay scene, but it really didn't do much for me. Okay, uh, I I really liked the opening. Actually, um, I did think they missed the opportunity to have the Ghostbusters theme after they transition to them, like in present day. Uh, I I sat there in the theater like, damn it, you almost had it, but uh, <laughs> <Getting close. laughs> But in terms of the opening itself, I liked it. I thought it 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 set up the mystery of whatever this uh, the orb was and what it was, what the powers of were to it, what it was capable of. Um, you know, when, when they transitioned to going actually inside the orb, I was like, yeah, we didn't need that. I, I just liked seeing like this sort of like what the like what the fuck moment where these uh, firefighters show up and everybody's frozen and they all break apart. Um, I, I liked the opening, um, but then let's, uh, let's, let's transition from that to our introduction back into the Spangler family. Now sort of full fledged Ghostbusters as they are, uh, in the throes of chasing down a ghost, busting a ghost. How did you guys feel about that whole, sort of that whole sequence of that? And not only... I'll also attack onto that the reintroduction to Walter Peck, who is now the mayor. Uh, uh, Vern, we'll start with you. Uh, <laughs> um, I like that scene. It was quick. It was fast. It was um, all right. Boom! We get right into the action. You know, then as they're chasing down the uh, uh, what was it? The sewer dragon. Sewer dragon. Yeah. Or <laughs> as they're chasing down the sewer dragon. Uh, it just gave us an idea of where they were at after we left them from afterlife. And, um, you know, the rambunctions, uh, Phoebe, who is still a, ch a genius child who is, you know, just trying to find her way as we're seeing in the film. But I'm, I'm going to jump ahead and get to uh, Peck because the first thing I was thinking of, 
how the hell did Peck become mayor? <laughs> <laughs> how did these things happen? I mean... Because they needed to bring the character back. That's yeah, <laughs> the, the script demanded it. <laughs> Again, he is kind of the villain of the story, so... <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, he's like, yeah, the secondary villain in a way, yeah. It's like, he nearly destroyed New York. <laughs> Twice. Yeah. <laughs> Te- technically twice. So, uh, but how did he become mayor? But I was, uh, I like, uh, as we were just talking about, like, uh, I like the mother. Uh, she's not, you know, oh, like, she just hops right into it. You know, she's just, I mean, the whole family is just hopping right into it. Like, it's just a natural thing that they do. So, obviously, they've been doing it for, like, years and um and of course just like the oko busters you know they they're getting in trouble and it's just kind of like all right um i wish they would have went more into you know um a little bit back into the past like how everything got started but uh, but again i'm glad they just kind of jumped into it so todd uh i thought it was a fun enough scene um the i like the design on the the dragon ghost I thought it was kind of just an, an interesting design. Like you saw, like it was still kind of scaly, but you saw like all its ribs right through it. Yeah, I thought that was really neat. I mean, he set up like Vern said, it's it's kind of like this is the the natural progression next step for these characters. Although they're doing kind of like almost sitcommy kind of things. Like like it starts yeah. off with Gary like like uh, uh, I'm your friend, but I'm trying to be your dad, and like Trevor. Yeah wants to drive because he's that age and you know, like you see kind of like the dysfunction in the family but also not dysfunction like <laughs> like they're normal in dysfunction i guess yeah if, oh i'm sorry i don't mean to cut you off if, if you had more no if you yeah go on it's, um yeah the so i like the i like it in theory i guess i don't dislike the way that they are now almost full-fledged ghostbusters um but uh Vern hit on something and when i was pointing uh because that's how i felt i would have liked to have like th- there was something missing where i would have liked to have maybe seen them rebuilding the ghostbusters in a way i feel like there's a disconnect with where the end of where afterlife left off to the beginning of this one where we just we miss everything it's almost like we missed the very first Ghostbusters movie, if you will, where they're going into business and they're kind of mm-hmm. building up their tech. This is just, it puts you right into it. So yeah, they kind I'm, of do like a time skip kind of thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. It, and it is, it is justified because everybody's older now. Everybody's like three or four years older. Um, and I guess if they were to have showed them rebuilding Ghostbusters, it kind of, would have just been the first movie again. So I, I get why they just put them already in the mix. But I guess I would have liked to have seen them move into the firehouse. And that's when they discover, you know, Slimer, which, by the way, <laughs> I'll bring my opportunity to bring him right back here. Show <laughs> off. <laughs> I got one and you didn't. Uh, uh, so, yeah. like, little things like that, I think I would have like to have seen and it would have felt more of a natural progression in that storyline um but i i do like them but busting a ghost right off the bat um it kind of is like a uh a sort of pseudo james bond cold opening again we're, we're thrown right into something before we get into the main crux of the story walter peck returning <laughs> like we said this movie has nostalgia bait written all over it. Um, it's it's unavoidable. Sometimes I like it. Sometimes I don't. In this scenario, I do like it. Um, even though it's it's sort of weird how he becomes the mayor. Like how the how the fuck did that happen? <laughs> but I mean, it has been forty years. So True. and he could have built up his whole smear campaign around that whole time because. The Ghostbusters had been shut down, so uh, I actually think they probably could have done more with him, but I get it. He's, like, in his 80s now. Yeah, he's kind of just around, I feel like. (laughs) Yeah, he's like a a tertiary villain kind of character, and um, I think he did more in the original Ghostbusters 
than he did in this one. He just kind of popped in every now and then to be like, I told you so. And uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I would have liked to have seen them do a little bit more, but I'm, o- I'm okay with him in, in this in this sense. So after that, obviously, Peck sets up the fact that, you know, they cause a lot of destruction and... Uh, Traditional Ghostbuster sense. Uh, yeah, I mean, how are you not going to destroy a shit ton of everything with what they do? <laughs> but then we move into where we, we start the melodrama with the family because under advisement from Peck, Phoebe has been suspended because she is a minor and they want to try to play by the rules, so to speak, that Peck has laid out. So the mom suspends Phoebe and this starts the whole teen angst <laughs> thing with Phoebe against her right, against her family rebellious. yes it's it's very very cliche um but how did we all feel that uh that was handled because shortly after that we meet phoebe's new friend melody the ghost um yeah friend. yeah well friend friend <laughs> heavily <Yeah>. heavy-handed <laughs> uh that there's more to it than just that but uh, Todd, we will start with you. The whole thing with the, with the family drama and and then uh, Melody. Uh, how did you feel about that and how it was executed? Um, okay, so let's see. The family drama. I think family drama is fine. It's your general conflict of the movie without being like the big bad guy kind of conflict. It's interesting to me. I, and, and I guess at first I don't really have the option. Um, and I'll get, uh, I'm sure we'll talk about it more later is they have like the, the like scientist core section and like, why didn't they just have Phoebe work there? Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, because it a good point. makes sense that that's where she should go. <laughs> You're suspended. You can't ghost bus, but here you could be over here doing, yeah, helping them here. Lab assistant, yeah. Which that's kind of how I was there. And it's, again, it's what they started to build up in the first, in the chase scene there where it's like. Like, okay, we're still getting used to this, and we're trying to make this family dynamic work, but it's obviously um, a little tough. Um, what, was, what was the second part that we were talking about? Uh, Melody. Oh, Melody. Friend. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I find it interesting that this is the second friendly ghost that um, Phoebe has come across. The, first, the second, like, helpful, not terrifying ghost like if like she's just kind of on fire um it's not casper <laughs> <laughs> could have named this chick casper and it would have been perfect a friendly ghost but <laughs> i thought and again we'll probably get more into this i thought they were going to do more with her than they actually did which is weird because she's still a fairly integral part of the film but they set up they they both obviously set up like big Chekhov's guns with her, like right away. Um, but they also like set up stuff with like her in a diner, named after her, that they never actually explore yeah. anymore. Yeah, they never yeah. really go into that. You see it, yeah. you're like, oh, oh, they're gonna revert. No, they they don't do anything. But like, oh, this is connected to something. Like like maybe she, like like she's putting on the space, and maybe she was like a narcissist that like burned down the initial thing but they named it after her like re- rebuilt it and there's just nothing more with it <laughs> um which i thought was kind of a wasted opportunity yeah um but like they're meeting in the park with the chess is is cute um and uh, overall a harmless character she was fine Vern. yeah uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that she, I think that kind of says it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, well, I think when she pulled out the chess set and the, the pieces start moving, I thought it was Egon. And, I I thought the same thing at first. Yeah, I was like, oh, cool, you know, uh, he's you know he's still just you know kind of still hunting them, so <laughs> which which would have been cool, um, but yeah, um, the the character itself, uh, I was okay with and well i'm pretty sure we'll discuss it later but uh i'm glad that she was just more than just the the friend like you know that she was just there as emotional support uh for phoebe and uh it turned out to be more 
So, I mean, I mean, she was okay. I mean, that's the best way I could uh, describe it. I mean, n- nothing more. <laughs> um, I will say that I thought she was completely unnecessary. Uh, and and I think a lot of it is just the way they executed her character. Like like Todd like Todd said, there was something there, and then they really didn't follow through with it. Um. Now the the I'll, I'll just I'll I'll just pull off the bandaid here. I, I did not I did not need the pseudo kind of romance between the two, and I guess it's it's purely from it's from two perspectives here. It's Ghostbusters. I don't need it that much. I I I don't need the teen finding herself drama and who am I sort of stuff. Second right. secondly. I just don't think it was handled in a way, and and I know a lot of people are probably going to say, "Well, it's just because it's it's Phoebe and another girl." Like, no, because I I legit sat there. I'm like, is that the problem I'm having with this, or is it if it was a if it was a young boy, would it feel the same? And and it's, I think it's just, it goes against the character of who Phoebe was and what they set up in the original. She is very much. Egon's granddaughter and she's very sort of emotionally shut off. She's very scientific and I felt like this even though she's 15 it still went a little bit further than I feel like it warranted with her character um where it just came out of nowhere. Um and like I was talking with Christina about this when we got out of the movie um her sort of angst with her family, I felt could have been driven more by her ego as a scientist that she feels like she needs to be a part of the Ghostbusters because obviously her grandfather was Egon and she's the smartest one out of any of them. And she knows what's best. And it seems like her whole drama is just set around, I'm, I'm 15 and I'm, I, I need to find my place in this family, in this world, which, again is fine if they wanted to go that route. I just don't feel like they, they hit the mark with it. Um, and that's that's my own personal opinion. I The ghost itself, like I said, um, Vern, <clears throat> excuse me, you mentioned how uh, when she first appeared, she started moving the chess pieces and you thought it was Egon at first. Mm-hmm. That's, that's what I thought too. I think that's what we all thought. Um, but then I started remembering. I'm like, okay, well, Egon moved on. And I would have maybe I'd like to have seen this more as a spirit using that emotional connection that Phoebe had with Egon to manipulate her into thinking that it is Egon that has come back and is making her do all this shit just to free Garaka, which we'll get to later. Um I would have maybe have liked to have seen that more emotional ma- manipulation than maybe sort of this romantic manipulation. Um, and the look of the ghost, um, it, she looked kind of cheap compared to the effects of the rest of the movie. It looked like just a blue chick sitting there on fire. Um, I would have liked if maybe if they would have played up a little bit more of the fact like, oh, well, she's choosing to look like this. Like, here's how I really look. And she's all, like, grotesque looking for a second because she's all burned and shit. But, uh, <laughs> like, just, could they could have had a little bit more fun with it than it did. Uh, like I said, I, I felt like it felt forced. Um, I don't know. Am I alone in feeling that? Um, now that I think about it, I, I felt like if she died violently in a fl- uh, fire that the flames around her should have been a little bit more uh, edgy yeah. instead of cute. Um, <laughs> should have been smoldering a lot. <laughs> Maybe a little disfigurement. I don't know. Uh, um, yeah. And that... I, I suppose that was because, you know, they, uh, as a writer, you want the audience to trust this character. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. One of the other silly scenes for me, this is me being a little bit nitpicky. But I think it was right after, was it that, or where she was talking with Phoebe in the firehouse, where she's just walking down the street. I'm like, a, a ghost just walking down the street? 
I'm like, that's <laughs> kind of walk down the like she can't just transfigure herself somewhere else, and then I, I don't know. It was it was just bizarre looking. Like <laughs> I'm like, that's that's odd. I didn't think I would see that just casually strolling down the street, but. I, that was a little nitpicky thing of mine. Where I was like, oh, okay, that's a little weird looking. It's bizarre. She's a ghost. She does what she wants. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, that is one thing I thought about with this movie. And I might get a little bit more into it. Um, is how much ghost stuff is 100% accepted in this world now. Yeah. Like, there's no skepticism. At, yeah. If you look back at the original, like... The Ghostbusters are the only ones that believe this stuff. Yeah. And everyone else is like, these guys are crazy or frauds, uh, which they are to both to a degree. But when you look at this this new movie, it's like every character they talk to is just on board with with ghosts now. It's like, not, and not only do we, we believe there's ghosts, but we we love that there's ghosts. <laughs> like, there's so many characters that are just immediately all in on, like, oh, ghosts. That's where I felt like the pet character probably could have been used a little bit more, or somebody mm-hmm. akin to him. Um, but I guess that, you know, I, I just did my Ghostbusters 2 review where I'm like, how could this whole, how could these people think that they're frauds after Stay Puffed? And then, and then, especially now after they turned the Statue of Liberty to life and sent it walking down the street, which, by the way, I love that nostalgia bit in the beginning, where they show the old commercials with the cereal, yes. the proton packs. <laughs> I'm like, I had all that as a kid. I well, had it all. Those were actual commercials too. Yes, right? those were the, the real commercials. commercials. Yes, because even like the proton pack, with I'm like, I have it, and I actually I brought it from Ohio. It's it's in the garage. I should have brought it out for this and showed it <laughs> off, but. Uh, but I loved all that, but yeah, it's like, there wasn't enough skepticism. I I could take it where, where the city is on board with them, but you didn't have, it's like, you just had the Walter Peck character and then that was it. There wasn't anybody else. I mean, I guess the, um, the fire master guy, I can't remember his name. Uh, I have it written down sort of a skeptic until he discovers, we'll get to him here in a second, but, uh, uh, but yeah, no, I, I agree with you, Todd. It's like there wasn't, like everybody's just on board with, oh, this is what's accepted. And maybe if they would have shown it where certain ghosts are actually interacting with people more, like in the city, to where like, oh, this is just an everyday thing, but you still have like your evil ghosts that are causing havoc and shit. I, I maybe could have rolled with that a little bit better. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, you get, you get in it like, I guess I wouldn't be skeptic either. I mean, they, the city of New York has almost been destroyed twice. I mean, the whole yeah. World. I mean, you had you have a big giant Stay Puft, and then you have the uh, well they discussed in the movie the Statue of Liberty, <laughs> River of Slime. Yeah, it's river, like River of Slime and everything else. So yeah, so I, I guess it's just you know, I guess when you go to New York and they talk about New York. It's it's just New York. It's just a natural thing that happens in New York. <laughs> <laughs> we got rats. We got homeless. We got angry right. people. And we got ghosts. <laughs> we got ghosts. That's, that's just... <laughs> um, we're reintroduced to a lot of uh, the characters returning from afterlife. We get podcasts coming back. We get Lucky coming back. Now, one of the main complaints I've heard from this movie, and one that I actually agree with, um, now that I've seen it, is it felt like the cast was a little bloated. Uh, it felt like there were too many characters, and especially ones that I feel like could have been consolidated down into just one. Um, and like I already mentioned about Melody, I didn't think she was necessary. I felt like they could have, something that'll happen later with her, I felt like they could have accomplished in a different way. They could have wrote it differently. But how do you guys feel about the cast, about the returning characters? And then I'll, I'll say my piece on that uh, after you guys go. 100% agree. That was one of this movie's biggest problems was they had so many characters that they really didn't have anything to do with some of the characters. And then they kept introducing more and more. Yeah. Like some of the characters coming back, like podcast 
Like, you could have had him essentially being, like, where Lucky was and stuff like that. They barely had anything to do with Trevor. <laughs> yeah. It, it turned into him trying to mouse trap Slimer. <laughs> that was his whole arc in this movie. That I gotta it. get Slimer. That was it. I And I liked some of the new characters I br- that they brought in. Like, I liked uh, the one character who was... New Age Egon, I guess. Oh, yeah. Like um, scientific guy. Like, I liked him because he was, like, oh, kind of a no-nonsense and, like, this is the science aspect of it. I can't so, remember like, that like character's that name, but I know who you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. Was it Lars? I, I, what's that? Was it, was it Lars? Lars. That was his name. It was, okay. like, Lars Pinder something or Penfeld or something like that, I think. It was a P name. The last name was a P name, but... On, and even me, uh... with all the characters, I thought that they were building up to like, okay, we're gonna have different teams then. Yeah. Pinfield, like... large Pinfield. That's it. <laughs> and then that didn't pan out really. So it was, it was just, it was, it was too much. Yeah. You needed to just trim the fat out with all of that. I I kind of agree. I think the kids were used in the wrong way. Um, like uh, I think. Podcast, even though he was staying with, um, um, God, I'm, I'm blanking out. Um, uh, he was interning with Ray. Yeah, yeah. When he was with Ray, uh, it really didn't, sh- he should have been studying with Ray. Um, uh, like, you know, like they divide the kids up so they can learn the business of uh, being a Ghostbuster. And he was just, I guess he was just there just interning where I guess he should have been studying what Ray Ray has been doing, like giving him passing on the knowledge to uh, a future generation, because uh, now that we're talking about that, I guess we could talk about Winston. I like the idea that Winston is uh, the philanthropist that he's, he believes that there's a future for Ghostbusters. And uh, that's why I like the setup for the movie is that they're tr- I, that's why I feel like that they're bringing in a new generation of kids to like Ghostbusters and to expand on it, not just in New York, but worldwide. Uh, when they go into, because basically the movie is about, you know, uh, they knew about the, the containment field and that was, that was the whole idea, but it was just, you know, that was part of the plot that it was just getting bigger and how many ghosts they're putting in there. And it's just way too much. So that, that Twinkie's not holding up. So. <laughs> <laughs> but um, with lucky uh, being with Winston, uh, I, I it, it was a good setup. I just think, I think they were just introduced differently, but they didn't really, like I said, I thought the movie was going to be all about the kids and it really wasn't. I mean, they played a, a part into it, but I think they were just used wrong. Uh, they weren't as annoying as I thought they would be. <laughs> if that makes any sense. No, 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 it so, does. Um, but, um, but yeah, podcasts and then there's lucky. And then the whole thing with Trevor is like, it was cute, but it was just like, I just wish he played a bigger part. Yeah. Uh, and it, yeah, this, uh, was, this was Phoebe's movie. R- r- right, about. right, 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 right. Yeah. And, <laughs> I, I agree with um, I, I agree with DJ about you know it it just felt like the wrong place to do a whole love thing um, with her and and that's what they were doing and I was wondering if that was just kind of forced uh, into the writing uh, because of like again the world <laughs> yeah <laughs> you, know? you know we we got to have change and we got to show it and it go if it's not part of the story then why even bother it's not necessary it was the flimsiest of excuses to advance the story enough to do like like i said we'll get to it It, it, it's like they used it just as a crutch to get the villain and i'm like it doesn't it's 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 hollow it doesn't mean anything it's just you needed a you needed an excuse to get the villain out and this is the way you did it like this is the way you chose to do it yeah it was unnecessary yeah um but yeah yeah the cast i felt was was bloated um uh, a lot of these characters probably either could have been omitted or consolidated into one so like you guys have mentioned about trevor served no purpose in this movie he didn't even really need to be there you could have completely taken him out what's different he didn't add anything he was just there 
to have scenes with Slimer. And and that's where uh, they got like the nostalgia thing we talked about. Well, we got to have Slimer back, which I love Slimer. It's great. I, I love seeing him back. And, and I like the way they did him in this too. It actually looked like a practical puppet that they just kind of superimposed. If that was CGI, that was some damn good looking CGI. He, uh, he buffed up. Yeah. <laughs> well, you see all that shit he was eating over the years, but Trevor, yeah, had no purpose in this movie. Wasted character. Um, lucky, no purpose. Wasted character. And I think about it from like a logic standpoint. Would Lucky really be there? Like I know she had she had a purpose in the original movie, uh, or in Afterlife. I'm sorry. She was uh, like the love interest of Trevor. They had their dynamic going on, and then she decides, well, I'm going to suit up and help you guys here at the end. But would she necessarily really be here in New York just testing tech? I mean, maybe. I'm not going to completely write her out, but it felt like another way. It it felt like an excuse to shoehorn a character in there that really didn't need to be there because she didn't serve any other purpose to the story other than she's there to test tech. She kind of tries to save Phoebe, and then she's with them at the end. She doesn't do anything else. That could have been any other random ass character or tech or somebody. And maybe one that could have been killed off to raise the stakes. Like, but it, as it is, she just kind of gets, she gets a little chilly from Garaka and then they, they rescue her. Uh, Todd, you were going to say something. Sorry. Yeah. Well, I, I don't, I don't mind her because part of her arc in, uh, an afterlife, I, which I watched, um, before I, I had to rewatch it to just I'm like I know I'm I'm gonna see characters in this new one and I'm not gonna remember them. <laughs> so I, I rewatched Afterlife before I watched Frozen Empire because I, I I just like I'm gonna need a refresher on this. Uh, and one of the things she says and it is like her whole family has always been in that Oklahoma town and it's just she wants to get out. And so like her coming in and being a part of like being yeah, the lab okay. tech. That's a good. It point. makes sense with her character. Um, but again, yeah, you just, they didn't do much with that. It's still wasted potential there for something. Um, yeah. So now that you mentioned that, yeah, I forgot that she said she's always been wanting to get out. Yeah. She's like, I like fourth generation dump or something. And yeah, she, she makes it known that she doesn't want to be there. So it does make sense for her character to end up where she is. Now podcast. Again, didn't really serve a great purpose, kind of just there. I would have liked to have seen him more as Ray's Padawan. Um, yes. Uh, I, I, I liked, I, I did think the reintroduction into them was funny, both Ray and Podcast, with Podcast helping Ray with a YouTube channel. And uh, when they smashed the old lady's watch, I thought that was kind of funny, which Ray's like, <laughs> like, like, no, lady, he's he's gone. All right, next, next person. <laughs> Uh, I, like, I thought that was funny. Um, but beyond that podcast really didn't do anything. He was just there because he, he was in afterlife. Um, and, well, and even in afterlife, he's kind of that character too. Like he's just kind of around in, in oh, afterlife. Funny. He's there as like a sounding board for like Phoebe. Like Would he's you there. Say he was kind of like Lewis. I guess he kind of fits in a similar kind of thing. See, I don't know. See, he I, does have like Ray elements, a lot of Ray elements to him. But yeah, I can see that's that. he was he was the Ray to Phoebe that uh, he was the Ray to e- Phoebe's Egon. Right. Phoebe was the scientist. Uh, podcast was the I'm into this whole spiritual mythology, crazy interdimensional stuff. I don't know the science behind it, but I know all this shit exists and right. So that's why I felt it was natural that he would be with Ray, uh, but really didn't. Again, another opportunity for a character, and it just it's wasted. They're just there, they're there filling up space, um, and this will lead me to one of my favorite comedians, if not my favorite comedian. He gets his role in a Ghostbusters movie, and that's Patton Oswalt. Um, <laughs> I was so looking forward to him, and I do think. His character is fine, but this is another one where it's like, 
this feels like it's in there just because, oh, look, we got Patton Oswalt to be in a Ghostbusters movie, or he wanted to be in one, so we wrote him a role. This could have been just Ray, Podcast, and Phoebe going to the library and looking this shit up themselves. Ray could have delivered all this exposition on his own. I get that he needed a translator, but we'll kind of jump around here because this now reminded me of something that uh, I felt could have been executed better. Um, so w- when we eventually get to it, when Garaka's released, how they said he needs to possess, he could he can't possess people, but he could possess ghosts, but he needs a human voice to recite the the verbiage to unlock him. And then they had that little wax cylinder that Pat Oswalt brought out, and it had the 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 incantation or whatever it was going, and we learn that that's what set Garaka free in 1904, or that's what set the the ice shit free. I thought they were gonna go full on Evil Dead, because when you and you <laughs> see that scene, podcast has his microphone, and he mm-hmm. and I thought he was recording it. I thought he was recording whatever was coming off of that cylinder. So that way, later on at the house or at the the lab, when their orb is there and the guy is studying it, I thought he was going to have that recording playing in the background. And all of a sudden, like I said, Evil Dead. Oh, what's this recording? And then you unleash uh, the army of deadites onto everybody. Uh, I thought they were going to do that here. And yeah, another like just another missed opportunity. And that's probably when we get to that scene. I'll I'll I'll, I'll bring it up again, but. Uh, but in terms of the cast, yeah, it was it was just too much. It was just too much. I like uh, Vern. You touched on Winston. I like that he's like the he's the business side of it now. Uh, he's the one with all the money. He's bankrolling it, um, and he believes that there's a future for ghost busting. Um, originally, I didn't think Janine had a purpose in this movie other than nostalgia. But uh, to my wife's credit, she did point out that Janine was kind of Winston's assistant. Uh, because of the, the, um, the post credit scene, the afterlife. So I'm like, so it would make sense that she's still kind of hovering around helping them out. Um, Bill Murray. They got him for a week. Yeah. They they, they got him for a week's worth of work and it felt like a week's worth of work. Uh, it wasn't bad. (laughs) Just in, just you know, just breezing by. He's the uncle who visits every once in a while. Yeah. <laughs> for but for his short amount of time in there, I thought he was. I thought he was good. Um, he was a highlight in this. But the one cast member we still haven't talked about yet is the fire master himself, Nadim Rasmati. I think that's his name, Nadim, or is that the actor's name? Oh yeah, name? yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. And he's the one who entered, who brings the cursed artifact, that orb that houses Garaka. How did we feel about his character? I've been talking for a while, but I will say I actually thought he was the funniest part of this movie. He could have been dialed back a, a here and there. Um, he kind of plays the same character, and no matter what he's in, because uh, <laughs> I saw him in uh, what you call it? Was it Obi Wan, the Star Wars? Thing. He was in there playing like a fraudulent Jedi. He was kind of a huckster. Oh, yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So he kind of plays the same roles, but I thought his shit was the, funny, was the funniest part of this movie, uh, especially when he's trying to sell the orb to Ray, and he's like, oh, he keeps increasing the prices or he gets more interested. <laughs> uh, but what did you guys feel? Like, like just on the character itself, not the whole fire master thing, which it's, it's sort of meh. But uh, just on his character, what did you guys think? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I think I might be on the island here. No, no, no. I, I, I got I to gotta take. I, I, wasn't, I didn't want to cut Vern off if he started talking. No, I'm actually trying to think about. I, I know what I want to say, but I'm actually trying to think, think about it. This, this is another where I think it's a missed opportunity. Because I think, and this is where Trevor should have been. Because Trevor is kind of the the slacker of that new class. He's like the like he's the like, van- oh, he's the van- he's the Vankman of the like- of the new group, essentially. Exactly. And he had a lot of those same elements where he's like this this loser who's not really living up to his family legacy. And like you could have done something where those two are learning together. And like building like their characters together, and I think that would have been 
it would have been a, a good way to incorporate him a little stronger into the story and do have something a little more beady to do with Trevor. You're talking about um, Trevor and Nadim, like yes. kind of being together. Okay. Yeah, kind of like pair those two, and and they do kind of pair those them up, but they don't do anything with them. Yeah, they're um, just kind of there to look at the the sex dungeon, as it were. <laughs> right. So I think I think if you would have like interlaced those characters a little stronger, I think, um, I think it would have been better for the characters in the story. Um, but I liked his character. His character was fun. He shows up in the armor in the end, and it's kind of... <laughs> slided down the fire pole. It's just screech going down. <laughs> I thought that was funny. <laughs> Um, but uh, yeah, I, I like the character. Okay, Vern, you've had time. All right, so all right, so Nadine's character, uh, the actor who plays him is Kamal, I believe Najani. I hope I didn't butcher the name. Um, but uh, I, like you said, he always plays the same character, but he's so good at it. Yeah. Uh, yes, he is. Like he did it in Star Wars. He did it in Internals. Um, and it it was such a great character. Uh, to me, because it kind of reminded me of the moments of like, uh, like, uh, you know, I'm a fan of the the real Ghostbusters uh, cartoon. Oh yeah, yeah. And it it that his character kind of reminded me of how that whole series went. You know, with different supporting characters, or you know, somebody's doing something and they had a purpose. So it, it didn't fall short with me. I actually kind of liked his character and how they put that. I mean, that's something they should have, I think they should have did more with that in the beginning. Yeah. Uh, and it, it kind of explained that. And they, they, they didn't really, uh, they didn't do that. Like you, like you were saying, they kind of missed their opportunity with that. Yeah. It's, uh, how do I want to, um, I felt like the introduction of that, the the i don't want to say MacGuffin, but of the cursed artifact that orb they did it in the obviously in in the in the flashback sequence i felt like they could have done more with that right off the bat and um we'll get to garaka in a second because that sort of is what you just mentioned about uh doing more uh i'll touch on that with garaka too because i think what they did doing more with nadim they could have done, I think, a little bit more with Garaka. Um, but so moving on, because I think we pretty much, did we touch on the cast by and large? I'm, I'm thinking of if we've missed anybody. I don't think so. I think we got mostly everyone. Yeah, we touched on the cast, but we didn't touch on, um, I don't think we touched a lot on the um, the original cast. Um, oh, the OGs, I mean, the OGs. Okay. We, yeah, we've uh, we splintered them, but we didn't really go into uh, detail. I think we talked about Winston. Uh, we talked about Ray a little bit. Um, uh, I I kind of like to talk about Janine just a bit. Okay. Um, I go. I uh, Janine is like the elder. I think she's always been the voice of reason. I've loved her, you know, uh, with the voice. It, it's it, they they kind of evolved her. Like in every movie, she's always evolved. And, you know, she's the street smart, you know, she's technically, I think she's also, I, I think she's kind of like the brains of the operation too. <laughs> like not like, like un, the uncredited brains of the operation. Right. Or right. she's I, like, I, I could see that. I, I've always felt like she was kind of the glue that held everybody together because you had all these different personalities and she was the one in the center that kind of kept them all together. Well, she's the mother. I mean, because even in the uh, even yeah. in the Afterlife movie, you know, she you know she's checking on Winston and she's talking about everybody, and it was just and she's she's like you know, like you said she's like the mother of the group. You know, she's checking in on everybody, taking care of them, um, and in in just that way. And she's she's not stuck. She's moved on. Like I said, she's always in every movie. She's always involved and. It was kind of great, and I got a little chill to see her in the suit. Yeah, <laughs> that was a comp her name. That was a total sort of wink and a nod to the real Ghostbusters uh, when she suited up in an episode or two. So, so yeah, that was nice. I, I liked that. that. Was great. Yeah. But once she, here's my one criticism though: once she suited up, 
she didn't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> they showed her with like that fucking Iron Man gauntlet sort of thing, like firing the proton or she was going to use it. Didn't do anything. Like she yeah. just was there. And again, missed opportunity. It's like they, they wheel these people out. Hey, look. And they just, they, it's just, well, are we going to do anything with them? Are they going to, nope, we're just going to put them there so you could look at them. And yeah. that's it. Yeah. A little yeah. bit more. I, I do agree, though. Like, it, it's nice to see them all. I just wish they could have been, especially in Janine's case, um, I wish they could have used her a little bit more. Because I felt like everybody else kind of had their place. Uh, Peter kind of shows up just to be Peter, and he's funny. But again, he really doesn't do much. I mean, they all kind of team up together to shut down the containment unit at the end. Um, Although but... I liked... I like that he did the interview. Yes, um, yeah. And like he was good for that. His bit with the door, um, I thought was very <laughs> on point for his character. Where he's like, they bang on the door and they think it's the ghost, and then it just opens up and it's him. Like, eh. <laughs> um, like I like I think for for what they probably had to go through with Bill Murray, I think they used the Bakeman character well. Yeah. yeah. Because he he is notorious for not being completely on board with Ghostbusters. Um, I think he's now he's softened more to it, obviously, recently than he had in years past. He wanted nothing to do with it. But I think since Harold passed, I think he's kind of softened to it a bit. Um, but yeah, I, for what they used him for, he was all right. I, I did like the um, the little gag where he hits the little um, is it the whatchamacallit, the little electrical panel door and there's a hidden box or the hidden bottle of like liquor or whiskey in there. <laughs> I thought that was kind of cute. Um, but so before we move on to like the villain and um, going back to Phoebe and Melody with uh, what they do with her and how they set him free, I will mention that when you watch the trailers and all the TV spots, it seemed like there was a lot that was cut out of this movie. There were scenes like they showed pictures of Bill Murray in like a dark coat and like a scarf. It felt like there was a lot more going on. Like it felt like Garaka being set free happened sooner and that there was a lot more of the ice. Like New York was frozen for a lot longer than just the last like 15 minutes of this movie. Um, but there was a lot of scenes when you go back and watch them, a lot of dialogue scenes that were just completely omitted out of this movie. Um, and it, it kind of gave the movie a sort of disjointed feel. It felt like it was chopped apart in some scenes. But going to Bill Murray, you know, he shows up, and then all of a sudden, what, in the next scene they show him he's wearing sunglasses? I'm like, <laughs> it's not completely out of the realm of possibility that he would just find random sunglasses to put on, but I'm like, where the fuck did those come from? Like... I, there were there were a few points in this movie, and it's gonna be it's gonna be me being a little nitpicky. Um, that did feel like editing was weird with it. Yes. So they have this one. They they have the one scene, and it was it was a harmless enough scene. So they have where they're running out of the library, and Ray sees the librarian ghost. Yes. Yes. And which is which is fun because she kind of does like this. Shh. Then all of a sudden, like he kind of like notions, and then she like transforms and chases after him. And then it, and then the next scene is like that never happened. There's nothing. Yeah. Connected. If, if... <laughs> and like and and all they and I, I feel like all they would have had to do was not have her transform. If she would have just said shush, and he kind of like nodded and just like carried on. Yeah. It would have been the perfect little like fun little cameo thing here here's how here's how you do that scene and i'm glad you mentioned that too because that did feel just completely just shoehorned in there because oh they're in a what's 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 a librarian ghost in there it felt like something they went back and added here's Mm -hmm. how you do it you have them chasing after a little possessor ghost which by the way is hilarious i love in the when they're showing them in its little containment unit how it's just possessing all these inanimate objects but so they're chasing after it as they're running, they're making a lot of noise. They're knocking shit over because they're trying to catch this ghost. They're trying to catch, you know, the, the garbage bag that the possessors possess. They just run right by, 
you could just ran right by the ghost. Like they don't even see it. They're just they're so focused on the bag. And then you cut back to the ghost, and then you just see it through the shh, as in be quiet. You're running. You're making a lot of noise. Mm-hmm. And that's all you needed. You didn't need it that's to it. transform into the ghost to chase Ray, because right. I know because what everybody remembers from the original, and it's still as is. It's still a fun little. It's still a fun moment, but it doesn't feel organic to whatever else is happening. But so, all right, we're gonna we're gonna jump forward to, um, the scene where Phoebe decides she doesn't want to be alive anymore for two minutes, <laughs> and. <laughs> Uh, she wants, she wants to have physical interaction with her ghost friend. And so she decides she's going to go to the, the testing area and get inside the ghost extraction device, which, okay, I, I could roll with it. It's a way to get ghosts out of cursed artifacts, whatever. But they mention, they mention it with people very lightly. I see. I completely. I because I must have glossed over that. If they, yeah, it, I missed it, all that they part. ask, it, can it can it like remove spirits from like living things? And they're like, well, like theoretically, yeah, but they never <laughs> say like, yeah, for two minutes. <laughs> yeah, it's like such an arbitrary number, like to put back. Like, I I don't know if there's some sort of science with like the brain or organisms. Like, do you only have two minutes after a person's like clinically dead? That like, you know what I mean? Like stuff starts shutting down. Either way, so she decides she's going to remove herself out of her body to be with her spirit friend. And oops, the reveal comes that the spirit friend has been working with Garaka, even though we, we the audience, knew later or early on that Garaka was using this, this ghost. Um, which I don't know how, if he's trapped in a orb, how he could project. I don't know. I don't know if I can get any of that. But... Uh, but he's been using this ghost to get to Phoebe because he needs the human voice to uh, unlock the orb and set him free. So, how do we all feel about that scene? Because I felt like it was, again, it leaned into something unnecessary. But I have a way, at least for me personally, as as a director slash pseudo writer, writer, uh, that I I would have handled that scene differently and and the melody character um whoever wants to tackle this scene first uh phoebe being a ghost and setting garaka free <laughs> not everybody right, now i was gonna say not I'll, everybody jump at once at that well i'll, I'll take care of this because i know todd's gonna finish it off well so <laughs> so basically they caspered her <laughs> like reverse casper <laughs> <laughs> If you've seen the, we, like, if you've we seen needed the more, Casper, we needed more Bill Pullman in that scene. Then, <laughs> <laughs> if you've seen the movie Casper, it's pretty much like towards the end where uh, he goes into the machine and he becomes, uh, was it? He becomes human. Yeah, he, then, yeah, he becomes his former self for like, right. a, like, like a Cinderella moment. Like, I'm only for I think like in like minutes or something. <laughs> yeah, they basically Casper her, and my 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 thoughts is. Every time you get a genius, it's just like, how come they're so smart, but they're so stupid? (laughs) I mean, I realize she's, you know, she's a young teenage person and stuff, but it's, it's like in, uh, it's just me over, maybe overthinking, but it's like, every time you get a genius, they do something stupid. It was like, did they, did they, I know they, they mentioned, like you guys said, they did mention something about the whole organic thing or whatever. But I go, seriously, I go, you're going to test this on yourself. <laughs> yeah. Well, and well, that's just... a, before Todd jumps in. That was the thing that they, um, I, I thought they could have set that up better where Phoebe, where she's just doing it. And the ghost could have been like, are you sure this is, are you sure this is really going to work the way you think it's going to work? And she could be like. Well, I'm a scientist. For scientific purposes, I need to, I want to test this to see if it can actually work. And like, okay, if there's nobody else here to test it with. I'll just test it on myself. Myself. Yeah. Uh, and they completely glossed over that. And but like you touched on, they they get these genius or borderline genius characters, and they always do something stupid. And <laughs> and I understand from the perspective of she's following more of her heart. 
and her heart is betraying her in this instance more than she's actually using her logical brain to think about what's going on. I understood it from that perspective. Was it still stupid? Yes. Okay, Todd, sorry for taking over. Yeah, go ahead, Todd. Stealing some of your thunder. There's a lot of pressure on me now. <laughs> go, <laughs> go. <laughs> well, I want to first uh, pretense this with, uh, have you ever met someone of genius intellect? They're actually like that. Like, there's a lot. Oh, of, yeah, 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 I've yeah. I've known a lot of, of really smart people who don't have a, a lick of common sense. Yeah, no. book, book smarts, not necessarily street smarts <laughs> sort of deal. So, to to a degree, I understand that. Um, I did think it kind of came out of nowhere, like the two-minute things. Like, it was not... It, it's so arbitrary. The passing comment does not set up, like, an entire thing. You know, really quick, you know what that passing comment is? It's to excuse whatever they were going to do later. It was added in. Uh, or either in pre-production or later on. I can't remember if it was an 80-yard line. Do you remember? Because I know I missed it. Was it said off camera? I do think it was said. I don't think anyone directly says it. I think I think it is a voiceover line. It's probably thrown in there like, well, we need to explain this later on. Well, we'll just have somebody say it off camera. That's where that comes in. It's, oh, fuck, we need to add this in. So, yeah, sorry to cut you off. But, yeah, that's exactly what that is. Yeah, and... Yeah, and, and like, I don't know, it, it it was an odd scene to me. Like, okay, there is something between them, they, they want to be this, she is a 15-year-old girl. Like, it was mostly a harmless scene to me. And and even in more towards the beginning when we find out that the melody is not all that she means, she even says, you know, like, like, I know we need a human, why does it have to be her? Like, they do set it up, they don't set up the science of the scene very well. Yeah, but they 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 do enough to set up like okay, like Melody's conflicted in this part and and all that. So the the scene itself was, I think there's better ways you could have gotten the the thing open, like you said, like the the recording and all that. Um, it was almost like red herrings with like better ways you could have done it. And like it was multiple choice, and they had three two or three right answers and they chose the wrong one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I didn't hate the scene um, really, but I do think there are better ways you could have gotten to it. Two different ways. I think they could have accomplished it in a, in better fashion would have been like how I explained before with uh, that, the blonde scientist guy. Um, Lars, yeah. yeah. Lars studying the orb has a recording or something going on in the background. Oops, it's opened up, and maybe Garaka comes out, possesses him, because when they showed the one trailer, when he was touching it, you see his hands start freezing over, and that's the direction I thought they were going to go. I'm like, oh shit, Garaka's going to come out of that and maybe take control of him temporarily to do whatever Garaka needs to do. They could have done it that way. I think it would have been better. The other way is if they were insistent on having Melody in there, I think... Saving her turn, her heel turn, for this moment and not alluding to it before, mm-hmm. I think would have been a better executed way of doing it. Um, I get that it's supposed to be tense where we, we know what her true motivation is. Um, and in this scene, we know there's probably something else that's going on with her. But they still could have, they, they could have dropped little allusions to that with her that she's not really all that she claims to be. She's There's something that she's keeping from Phoebe this entire time, and they didn't need to spell it out in the scene where she's cartoonishly just walking down the street and having <laughs> psychic conversations with Garaka. It could have been more like she's she's sprinkling in little bits here and there like, you know, I would really like to see how you guys do your stuff. I would really like to mm-hmm. see this. Can you show me your lab or something? And it could have been like, oh, I don't know if I should trust this character or not. Because after that scene with Garaka on the street, you already don't trust her. I mean, she's already sketchy to begin with, but now in Cemented, you don't trust her. They should have played with that more until you get to this scene. And then you think, oh, there's going to be this nice moment between these two. Oops, no, I've just used you the entire time to set Garaka free. And 
And then they could have played more, I think, with the emotions in that moment with not only Phoebe, but with us, the audience, because it could have been like an, oh, you fucking bitch. Like we didn't, we maybe could have seen this coming, but now it's, now it's the, the, you know, the reveal that mm -hmm. you've just been playing this girl the entire time. Um, that's how I, that's how I would have done it. For me, that's better. I don't know if everybody else would have liked that better, but I think saving that reveal would have been more of an oh shit moment for this scene and would have added more of a oh my god, we're fucked, like, sort of scene. But in terms of Garaka himself, uh, so we're, we're now, Garaka has been set free. What do we feel about this villain? Uh, I know we touched on it earlier before we started diving into the movie. I know I liked him. Vern, I think, said he liked him. Todd, like we'll, him. we'll go with you uh, first. How do you feel about Garaka? And not only just him as a villain, but how he was used in this movie. Uh, I mean, he was okay. He was the big threat in the end. Like, because like... And actually, before, be movie, be before, before you finish, we could wrap this up as the, the, the climax of the movie, too. He's set free, shit gets frozen... And we could talk about how he's used at the end here. Because I know I think we're inevitably be, inevitably going to be going into that. So just have at it with Garaka and like the third act of this movie. <laughs> yeah, like I guess you don't need him to do anything like like major. Like I said, if he would have been freed at like the halfway point, I think it would have been more interesting. And him as like this looming eventual presence yeah. that they have to get to, I think that would have been a little better. Um, but like Gozer doesn't do much in the first movie until the very end. No, um, and that's... Vigo plays a little bit more of a stronger part. Um, you don't even realize it's going to be Gozer, uh, Gozer again in Afterlife. Uh, and, um, so like it was fine. His design was interesting. Uh, except for his old man face, I didn't love that. <laughs> uh, but he had like, like he had like elements of like a Wendigo, which was kind of neat, which has to do with cold and whatnot. So like the cryptid guy <laughs> in me is like, oh, that's that's a real neat thing. I mean, you are wearing your cryptid shirt. I, I am. I'm wearing my my, my <laughs> Mothman and Flatwoods monster <laughs> shirt. Um. But uh, I, I thought he was, for what he was, it was okay. I would have loved to see him be more of a, like an environmental issue earlier in the movie. But we, and we've we mentioned that half a dozen times now. But, I mentioned it more. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> but I thought he was, he was fine. Like the way they took him out was okay. <laughs> yeah, um, but that's the way all the Ghostbuster movies and the the bad guy, like the big bad, always kind of gets taken down and not like a really spectacular way in most of the Ghostbuster movies. The first one was literally like, okay, well, I guess we'll just cross our streams, and then it was Gozer was beat. Yeah, that's what I would say. Like Gozer in the original, it was just out of convenience. Where this thing we shouldn't do, oh, we're gonna do it now and kill Gozer. Right. So, yeah, I can understand I that. Was, like, hosed down <laughs> and shot, and that's it. Like, so, <laughs> he's, like... He's bukkakied, sir. He's bukkakied <laughs> with happy slime. <laughs> <laughs> so, I thought he was he was fine. A again, like most of this movie for me, it was okay. Burn. All right, so, I agree that I felt they should have used him more. Uh, but I did love his presence. I like how they, like when he enters the firehouse and you just see this long, slim present uh, with the big horns and stuff. Uh, I thought that was great. The, but I, I kind of felt the same that I wish they would have did more. I wish we would have saw more of him. Um, but I get that's kind of like the whole suspense. Uh, I did have issues about why did the ice start from the... Um, from the ocean, from the, from the beach. <laughs> yes, thank you. I was I was actually going to mention this, but thank you. You could tackle it. It's all yours. Yeah, yeah I, I, <laughs> I had issues with that because I mean that was kind of like the whole build up of the trailer, 
And, you know, I, and sometimes I realize because, you know, we all we all have done films and we we've all done to the point where it was like, all right, we've we've seen this done. But how about if we do this? Um, and I get that portion of it. I get that, you know, you want to do something different, but it kind of made no sense uh, that it just came up off the <laughs> beach and it was just it was for the trailer. Yeah. Right. Right. And everything was. Yeah, and, total trailer moment. And he's in the city, so it's just like, where the hell is this coming from? There's nothing out there. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, it should start outward in the city and then outward. Then I wouldn't understand that. It's like he but, got set free and then like I'm gonna circle out over the Atlantic and build up strength and come back. Down yeah, to the... <laughs> I'm just gonna take the Long Island ferry 20 miles <laughs> offshore. <laughs> So I I had a big issue with that. I mean, I love it in the trailer, but it was just like, uh, now that you see the story, it was just like there was no point to that. Yes. So uh, that that was one of my big issues. And, yeah, they uh, almost didn't even need that scene in. Like, you could have filmed that for the trailer, mm-hmm. and it would have been – that would have been cool for a trailer, and just don't have it in the movie at all. Yeah. Right, like, right. Total right. just tra- – just a, like you said, just a trailer, and that's it. Right. 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 So, show it, show it as a newscast or something. I, I don't know. Right. So, but um, I mean, you don't even need it. Like you have them in the city already. You have them released. Mm-hmm. That's fine. You don't even need that whole scene. It should have been. Yeah. It should have. The epicenter of it should have been right where he was released, or wherever he was at. And then it just, it just radiates out from the expands. center of the city. Yeah. Yeah. I will say that I missed in this. And like I know I, I down on like the the nostalgia baiting, but it feels like every single Ghostbusters movie has had that one montage of all the ghosts coming out and just interacting with the public. And like it's just like little bits, you know, the Titanic coming in and like better late the than one never ghost shooting up from the subway <laughs> stairs, like just that, like those scenes. Yeah, and this one didn't have that at all. It didn't the the most you had was that beach scene. Yeah. Which everyone had already seen, and there wasn't even any ghost. It was just ice shooting up it was everywhere. Like Indiana right. Jones ice spikes coming out trying to like impale people. Yeah, there wasn't there there wasn't like a montage sequence. Like Yeah, so like take and, and they even have like the one like the containment release all these ghosts. If you want a bit where you see like old ghosts that we've seen before. Taxi cab ghosts would have been great. Take out the beach <laughs> scene and put in that. Yeah. Well, it's kind of like when uh, they talk about the comp- containment unit, because you, I thought the whole premise is, when they start that in the beginning of the film, I thought the whole premise is what's going to be, how do we transfer all these ghosts into the new containment unit? <laughs> that was something and, I thought of, too. Yeah, yeah and they, they, uh, they just said, talking about that, and then all of a sudden, it was just nothing. And it just It's a plot that point that is just dropped. Yeah. All you get is, like, the, our containment unit's overloaded, and I thought it would play more of a significance in the in the final act of that movie or in the release of Garaka and nothing. Right. It served nothing. no it served no purpose. Other no than purpose whatsoever. Other yeah. than, again, the flimsiest of excuse to say at the very end, uh, well now our containment unit's completely empty. We can now we have we have enough storage space in our containment USB drive to trap <laughs> Garaka and he won't like no corrupted files. It's not like we'll only get half of them in there. Like, so yeah, it's the flimsiest of excuses to be like, well, now we have room and we could trap Garaka because we have him here at the firehouse. And getting back to our big bad, like again, like I'm a huge fan of the real Ghostbusters cartoon, and I kind of felt like it was Sam Hain where he takes over the ghosts and he takes over the fire station. Yes, this would have been cool if they used the Sam Hain thing. So I, uh, so I'm just more of the real Ghostbusters cartoon <laughs> nostalgia uh, uh, there, you know. And uh, something else I thought of, too, going back to Slimer, uh, I think Slimer was there for more uh, product placement. Oh, yeah. Because I noticed it as we were talking, I'm sitting up there and as he's giving, like, you know, trailing him through the Cheetos to the ghost trap, uh, I remember going to the grocery store and seeing the Ghostbuster uh, logo on the Cheetos. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, Slimer's Slimer's the mascot uh, of the franchise. More so than, uh, like I would say, Stay Puffed or anything else. I think Stay Puffed is probably number two, obviously, because they have the mini puffs return in this. Yeah. For some inexplicable reason, they're there. 
Uh, not to say that they weren't funny. They were still funny. But that was my wife's favorite part of the movie. They were cute and adorable. <laughs> Mine too. That was Christina's favorite part too. Uh, but yeah, like everybody loves the mini puffs. So obviously they're going to be there. They have no purpose being there, but whatever, they're there. Yeah, in, in terms of uh, Garaka, I like the villain. I like the look. I like the lore. I like the look of Frozen New York City. It gave something different than just spirits running amok i guess the next step they can go is new york city's on fire in hell but <laughs> which which, which if, if, move, if that does monsters. happen you could come here first and it's been it's been put out there but um yeah uh, i i just i just think his presence was missed about halfway through this movie and it like like you said todd gozer in the original really didn't appear until the last act when they're on the rooftop we finally see Gozer. But Gozer's presence was so interwoven throughout that whole movie. You felt it. You felt a looming presence. Here, they tried to do that with the orb and all these other things going on, but then they would cut to all this sidebar shit with family drama that you almost, you forget about the villain. You for, it's, there's no presence there. So it's it's choppy, and then by the time you get back to Garaka, which when he's released from the orb, I do love that shot. I love the shot of Phoebe standing there in the darkness and you just see his glowing eyes above glowing her. Glowing eyes, yeah. Yeah, I'm like, I oh, I'm like, that's a scary shot. I'm like, that's really they, cool. They did that right. Yeah. But then after that, like you said, Vern, all of a sudden he 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 goes on the loose and then he disappears over the Atlantic, I guess, and then <laughs> brings everything across. Where I said before, the epicenter should have been right there. All the manifestations should have came out from that point. And yeah, it was just, that's a, like a, it's probably a nitpicky thing. But like you said, when, when we do these things long enough, like we've all worked in film and writing and, uh, and to various degrees, it feels so odd that he's there, but everything is coming from somewhere else. It feels like a completely different entity is coming that it's not him. So that was a little odd, but I, I, I do agree, Todd. I think he's, he shows up at the end and is kind of just off fairly easily. I, I, I like how the proton streams don't work on him. And this is where, That's ag a cool effect. again, the setup should have been earlier. His release should have been sooner because they set up the proton streams don't work. And literally within 10 minutes, they they've solved that issue. They cut the or they cut the brass pole down, and Phoebe just in the matter of minutes melts this brass and <laughs> and coats the uh, cyclotron. I think that's what it's called. Coats it in brass so that way she could fire brass onto uh, Garaka and take care of him. Which which I want to point out just real quick. They cut down the pole, and then later the pole is fine. <laughs> I believe. No, I'll answer that. I believe there's two. There's two fire poles. There's two. There's two okay. poles. At least, in terms of the video game, <laughs> I gotta go back. <laughs> I gotta go back and watch the movies again. But I believe there are two separate poles that go from the second story to the ground floor. Oh, that's okay. That's right. Okay. Um. Right. I, but again, I gotta go back and watch the movies to see if that's actually there, or if that was something I'm just. Imagining from the video game that I'm putting in real life. Or what would have been funny is if Nadim would have been sliding down that pole and he doesn't realize part of it's been cut and then he just collapses. He just falls. He falls on his face. <laughs> that would have been good. Uh, but yeah, uh, he's defeated a little too easily. He shows up too quick and, uh, and, is, and is gone before it's like, we hardly got to know you and you're gone. Uh, that's where I think he should have been set up earlier. And like I said before, where I feel like there's a large part of this movie that's been cut out where New York was frozen for a lot longer because you needed to set up that this is a real threat that the Ghostbusters can't handle and how are they going to handle it? And they, they do that, but it's, ha but it's set up in like five minutes and it's, it's all wrapped up. Yeah, I, I just I, I didn't I didn't like the way that they handled him. Other than that, uh I, I liked him. I thought he was a really cool and different sort of villain. 
real cool. Real, real cool. <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> You're not putting me in the cooler. <laughs> but then, yeah, then the movie, uh, you know, they, they trap him in the in the open containment unit, which it was nice to see the old Busters kind of uh, get unfrozen and go down and, and uh, open up the containment unit. There was too much... <laughs> This, it reminded me of this, and there's too much of the. Uh, this is a little nitpicky moment, but there's too much of the. Uh, if the light is green, the trap is clean. We got it. <laughs> we got it. It could have repeated it. We could have said it in the beginning, uh, when they're showing how the containment unit is is used, and then they just repeat it at the end. That's it. You just bookended. <laughs> you didn't need it. You didn't need to be beat over the head with that little line. But then we wrap up the movie, at like. Everybody's unfrozen, you know. Uh, Batman shined his uh, the, the, <laughs> the 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 sun rays down and unfroze everybody. Uh, the dog can finally urinate, uh, and then everybody's around the Ghostbusters house because I guess they just know <laughs> uh, that this is where all this was taking place. And then nice little like Walter Peck moment where he's like, "I'm gonna shut you guys down," but again. How again? He he was fucking frozen. Like, I think that would have been a nice moment for him to be like, "I'm gonna, you know what? I was gonna shut you guys down, but thank you for saving us." It would have been like a nice, like almost like a, "I'm still gonna get you one of these days," but thank you. It's almost like a begrudging today, thank you. you. See, no, I, yeah. No, I kind of get that. I kind of get to the point where he uh, he's got that mentality where he just. I don't care what happens. I just hate you guys, and I want you out of business. <laughs> yeah. So he was that character, and I'm I'm actually perfectly okay with that. <laughs> I I think they could have done it like I guess the way I'm describing it is like to play it up for the cameras, like for the news people there. Like he could have been like, "I'm here to thank the Ghostbusters," and then he could have pulled one of them close and be like, "I'm still gonna get you one of these days." Like right, right. right. Uh, like I, I still time. yeah I'll, I'll get you next time. Like uh, Iron Man two, when um uh, the senator is like all happy with Tony Stark, and then he pricks him with the the pen. He's like, "Oh, that's what a little prick feels like," or something like that. <laughs> Could have had that moment with Walter Peck, where I'm gonna put on this happy face for the cameras, and then but I'm gonna pull you close and be like, "No, I'm go- I'll get you guys down the road." Like this doesn't change anything. Um, but instead they kind of did it in a goofy sort of way um I, I i thought the guy calling peck dickless off camera was kind of funny it, you could tell a completely 80 <laughs> yard line but i thought it was funny yeah. um peter's interaction with them i thought was was funny so it, it wasn't a bad ending and i'm and you know the sewer dragon's been released we got to go catch him again and they're off the on adventure another adventure continues. yes but well, yeah you know they're back in business so yeah. So I mean, so so we've gone through this whole movie, I think, kind of with a with a fine tooth comb. I mean, shit, we've been talking about it for almost an hour and a half now. We <laughs> missed one point. Um, we didn't talk about Paul Rudd. Oh yeah. Okay. We didn't talk about Paul Rudd. But nothing, nothing really too big. I mean, he's. I think he plays the character well. You know, uh, just trying to find his place in the family, and uh, that was just about it. I I right. still I, think I, he's a good fit. Yeah, I touched on him a little bit in the beginning with the family stuff. Like, I'm I'm trying to be your dad, but I'm trying to be your buddy. But I, I'm also not actually your dad, so I don't know what to do. And, like, his little arc, like, he, he at some point he talks to her while she's not there. And, like, that's a cute enough little scene. He, like, he was fine in this movie. I, I felt like for the arc that they were trying to do with him, it felt rushed um maybe that's just me i i guess like i said it it plays more into the that family dynamic that i thought worked well in afterlife that just they tried to do it again here in a different way with different scenarios with these characters and it just wasn't it didn't feel the same it didn't have that same sort of emotional core to me and a lot of it felt forced um paul rudd i thought was okay i mean we all know Finn is kind of the the Vankman ish of the the kids. Paul Rudd is kind of the the adult new Vankman. He's the middle aged 
Bankman 2.0 to a degree, even though right. he's not a little bit of Ray in there. Yeah, he's <laughs> not the cynic, but he's he's yeah, he's probably more of like a Ray now that I would mention it attitude wise. Um, but his his delivery and his and his uh, personality is kind of Bankman ish in a way, especially when it comes to his interaction with the mom. Uh, but I, I thought he was okay. I thought they probably could have wrote the stuff for him a little bit cleaner. Um, I, I liked, like I said, I liked him trying to be uh, the dad and kind of filling in that stepdad role, but it, it, they didn't, they didn't do enough with it. I think it's like they mention it and then they have one scene where he kind of puts Phoebe in her place and then that's it. And then he then yeah. he apologizes for it, and then it's never addressed again. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Um, since discussing it, at like we have, where we we opened up we opened up the Garaka orb, <laughs> if you will, <laughs> and kind of went layer by layer. Have has anybody's thoughts or feelings changed on this movie at all? Have they improved? Have they kind of gone down since we've started talking about certain things? Like, oh yeah. Really didn't think about that. Uh, Todd, I'll start with you. Uh, no, I think I um, I didn't have huge like high expectations going into the movie. Um, like I said, I thought the last I thought Afterlife was an okay movie. I thought this was an okay movie. Um, every everything that we've talked about has either been like like oh okay that was that was what they did right or that was what they did wrong, which is really the conversation I wanted to have <laughs> because that's how I generally felt with this movie was like, it's like, no, I didn't, there, there have been movies that we have discussed that I have gone much greater lengths that I do not like. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, but like this one, I generally enjoyed, I, I like, here's my list of notes that I <laughs> would have done differently, but overall an okay movie. Okay, really quick before we get to Vern. On the spot ranking, where would you put this out of the five Ghostbusters movies that have been? Because you got the four in the official series and you got the one reboot. Where would you put where would oh, you God, put I don't even think about the Ghostbusters <laughs> after or, uh, Frozen Empire? Where would it rank? Uh maybe three. Three by a hair. So uh, above that would be, I'm guessing... Original and two. Okay. Um, Afterlife, number four by, like, a hair. Um, and I honestly don't think of the 2016 one enough. To, Nobody does. To really it's put all it right. any, anywhere <laughs> in there. The less said about that movie, the better, in my opinion. <laughs> I, thought, I thought that movie had... It's... Parts it's had had its credits and a lot of fumbling in that one too. That's one we should come back and talk about and just listen to me, fucking bitch. We need to talk about that. <laughs> oh no, no, we don't, we don't. Not unless there are people that are, have been hanging around watching this that demand it. Other than that, no, that could just that could stay in the containment unit. We're not going to touch that one. <laughs> so Vern, overall, uh, have, do your opinions still feel the same? improved gotten worse and where would you rank this all right um uh, i mean you guys have given me a lot to think about that i didn't think about when i watched it uh but my feelings are still the same i still enjoyed it uh it's great that you know uh they did something different uh instead of uh the same um uh, i still i i love some of the nostalgia stuff um and I, I, I just had fun with it. I mean, I went into it, you know, thinking I go, either it's going to be really good or it's going to be really bad. <laughs> but it, it was all right, and uh, and I enjoyed myself, except for not getting my popcorn bucket. Uh... <laughs> Two thumbs down, no popcorn bucket. <laughs> my ghost trap popcorn bucket. <laughs> oh fuck! I dropped them. Shit. Show off. Um... <laughs> <laughs> so the little girl lucky i didn't tackle her but uh <laughs> just Shawn michaels super just kick just one bam minute away, one minute away <laughs> um but i would rank it as see re really quick what you should have done is played chess with her and, and gotten on her emotional side and then just snatched the bucket <laughs> <And> then, <laughs> your spirit from your body for yes 
just die for two minutes so I could snatch your bucket and run away. <laughs> but anyway, you said... Well, I, did, I did think about sneaking over Scooby-Doo style, style and uh, take the bucket and <laughs> go back to my seat. <laughs> but yeah, um, yeah, three. Definitely three. Okay. All right. Uh, what would you rank above it? What, what uh, we're wanting the to... First the first two? The first okay. two. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Uh, like... I, I don't think my opinion has changed a lot. Um, I think with certain elements, I think that we have discussed, the more I talk about it and talk through it, I think like some of the Phoebe stuff, some of the family stuff, um, the stuff with Garaka that they, that they did, those things have kind of dropped down a little bit more um, in where I'm like, you know, I could have been talked out of some of that stuff. Like, the Phoebe with the emotional stuff and maybe acting stupid, I, I kind of give more of a pass to now. Because Todd brought up a good point about sometimes insanely intelligent people can do not be... Things. They can do stupid things. They don't have the best street smarts. So, I, I can give a pass to that more. So, uh, I think it still is where it's at for me, which is number four. Uh the original will always be number one. That just it can't be topped, in my opinion. It's, it's, it's the perfect comedy. It was so well written. Uh, Ghostbusters two is number two. I know my wife Christina will not agree with me there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> she does not like Ghostbusters two at all. Uh, but I have a lot of nostalgia for that movie. It's not perfect, but it still does enough for me to be like it's still Ghostbusters. Then it's Afterlife probably by the slimmest of margins behind two. Uh, and then Frozen Empire is maybe a, a, a notch or two below Afterlife. And that doesn't mean just because it's four out of five that I hate it or dislike it. It's sort of like how I described to my wife. It's out of preference. You asked me to watch a Ghostbusters movie, which one am I picking? I'm picking the original. Okay, after that, you can't watch the original. Which one are you watching? I'm watching the second one. After that, which one? Oh, well, between Frozen Empire and Afterlife, I'm probably going with Afterlife. Um, so, and then way down at the fucking ass end of this ladder is <laughs> is the reboot. So, uh, there's a reason why they they are not continuing on with that uh, with with that film and that part of the franchise. It's because it sucked. Sorry, uh, it, it was terrible, and everybody. For the most part, a lot of the fans hated it. So, but yeah, to wrap up Frozen Empire, I thought it was, I thought it was okay. It was okay. Um, the, the criticisms I saw online before I went to go see the movie were valid. After I saw it, I was like, no, these are, because you did have people online that were like, no, like the movie's perfect. It's great. It's great. It's great. And then you, on the on the other side of that, you did have a lot of people saying it was terrible. I didn't think it was terrible. It wasn't terrible. It could have been better, but it wasn't terrible. Um, yeah, like, I think like IGN gave this like four out of ten. No, nah, it's like, it's not that bad. Uh, it's, it's, it's it's not, not that bad. bad. It's maybe a it's maybe a six six yeah, and a half six, out of ten for me. A half, yeah. Yeah, it's 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 all right. It's it's fine. It's not one that I'm gonna be actively going back to watch. I think, if anything, the only parts, the only real parts of it I really liked, I liked the beginning. And then once Garaka showed up, I liked that whole scene. I liked, if that was the majority of the movie, I probably would have liked it a lot more. But, uh, like I said, it's it's fine. Uh, it is what it is. Uh, I do hope it makes a lot of money. Uh, as I want to see the franchise continue, I don't want to see it just be stuck in... I don't want it to be stuck in developmental hell because mm -hmm. I think it has potential to move forward with, with better villains. Like, like, um, uh, Vern, you brought up ones from the real ghostbusters. I would love to see live action, Sam Hain. I would love to see live action Sandman or the boogeyman. Like, Ooh, like those, those, those would be really cool to see. And I, and I have a feeling that's the direction they want to go. They want to go, uh, they want to bring in more stuff from just outside of the films. They want to bring in comic book stuff and cartoon stuff. So I think that would be really cool. And I, and I hope that as long as they're done well, and it's not like resident evil where <laughs> they're just shoehorning in shit to shoehorn shit in. 
<clears throat> I'll be okay. Just make the movie. The movie Frozen Empire was competent enough that I still enjoyed it. Yeah. If that's if this is the base moving forward, I'm okay. It you can only get better. Yeah. Or worse. Well, oh, no, it could get worse. It can get worse. <laughs> There's Failure a, is always an option. Yes. <laughs> that's the that's like the old cosmic octopus motto. Failure is always an option. <laughs> But all right, that's going to wrap up this long, long review discussion about Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. But, you know, that's that's the that's the thing I wanted to go for, where it was just kind of a, an open discussion where it's just three dudes hanging out, discussing the movie. Uh, for those of you that are listening to this, if you have made it this far, thanks for sticking around. And... Uh, Hopefully we'll see you guys down the road and hopefully we will be doing this again in the future, either with a new movie or an older movie. We'll figure that out and see uh, if it is an older movie, which one we want to do. But anyway, I'm going to wrap up this recording. Uh, I want to thank uh, my good friends, Todd and Vern for joining us here on dead Jester cinema. And we will catch you all later. Peace. Peace.